Central California and one in Southern California. I have the great uh, privilege of being able to come back here to this church because this is my home church where I grew up um, from birth. So um, welcome to our community, welcome to this church. Um, Wesley United Methodist Church uh, really has a history of 122 years here in the downtown community. Um, and our church along with the uh, San Jose uh, Buddhist Temple, the Betsuin, uh, we help along with the other community organizations to really kind of um, keep this the heart uh, of the community, even though our community is dispersed throughout Silicon Valley and even beyond. Um, so thank you so much for, for coming today. Uh, as I looked, as I made name tags this week, and as I looked at all of your names and all of your roles, uh, uh, I, I was just so impressed and amazed at the, the distinguished uh, group that, that is before us. So thank you for your desires to learn more about the Japanese American experience and history. Um, let's see. I wanted to share just this real quickly. Um, it's so important for me to I, to know that you are interested in the Japanese American experience. For me, growing up here, it wasn't always easy. In fact, when I moved from San Jose to Los Gatos with my family at the age of two, uh, the neighbors in the community that we were trying to move into, they all peti petitioned the realtor to not to sell to this Japanese American family that was coming into their neighborhood. So for me, growing up, it was really tough. Um, a lot of derogatory names uh, that I was called. It was tough to kind of feel um, good about yourself. Um, so this church was an important aspect of my growth and development and self-acceptance and affirmation of who I am. Um, and so thank you for taking interest and in being here today. It really is important. Um, I want to introduce Robert Honda. He is our facilitator, moderator for our panel discussion today. He is the newscaster with NBC Bay Area. And he has a wonderful show. Uh, for those of us that get up early on Sunday mornings, he, is, uh, he hosts the Asian Pacific America show. And it's a wonderful show. Features a lot of local Bay Area news that's happening in our communities. So with that, Robert, we're so glad that you are here. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, well, he said everything I was going to say. So. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you. Uh, and I also, uh, my grandmother was a uh, longtime member of this church too, uh, growing up. So it's uh, very, it's always nice when I can come here and do uh, an event here, and I've done many. San Jose Japan Town, he was talking about this church being a sanctuary. San Jose Japan Town is kind of like my sanctuary these days from the world that's out there right now that I don't really sometimes recognize. Um, it's a world run by a president of Congress that seems to be operating in a way that not only kind of ranges from kind of humorous to scary. Um, I, uh, it was kind of hard to believe just watching last night. Uh, the GOP budget that they were working on. It's basically written on paper like this. <laughs> they were showing it, and I thought, gee, I changed my speech a few times already, so uh, I'm wondering if that, how fluid it is for that budget. So it's just a very strange um, situation. And uh, uh, as he mentioned, uh, you know, Asian Pacific America, we try to focus in on like community issues, try not to get so uh, topical that we kind of end up ignoring a lot of the small stories that don't get covered. And in fact, that was sort of my uh, mission when we when I started the show and I got the opportunity to do this was not to kind of fall into that trap of ending up doing uh, shows that you know just try to find the headline story to do, but actually just try to cover things, issues, and organizations. And uh, especially uh, one area too is in the cultural and arts area uh, that just don't get any coverage. And I just felt like you know we need to show more like that than we need uh, a show that only features my Honda every week, which was uh, what newspaper show would end up being. <laughs> uh, you know, at one time though, um, I thought that in Japanese internment was basically you know relegated to a very significant important but mainly historical kind of uh, topic, uh, sort, of, sort of one chapter, a past chapter, uh, not realizing that the issue of 
um, isolating and dividing communities along racial lines would become kind of a uh, uh, contemporary issue again. And uh, it's just really strange to see um, people considering things like internment or building border walls as sort of a plausible option. Uh, at one time, I don't think I would have thought that that was what could happen, and I hadn't really believed that could happen until now, or at least since last November. And uh, that's why I think that this forum by the uh, Faith and Politics Institute, which, by the way, is a somewhat ironic title to have faith in politics these days, but uh, I think that uh, that's why events like these are so important, and that's why I'm very grateful to be here to be a part of it, as well as very thankful to see so many people here taking part in the event and uh, being so interested and so devoted to trying to uh, know more about the culture as well as be a part of the community. I uh, wanted to go over some of the goals of the Faith and Pol Pol Politics Institute from their website. Uh, today when our leaders, as we talked about, are so divided on issues, they often don't listen to one another. The work here is more important than ever. This is why Faith and Policy Institute has set these three goals over the next two years. Strengthen personal leadership through spiritually grounded group dialogue and reflection. Second, bridge divides of political affiliation, faith, and race by inspiring conversations around the values our nation's leaders share, conscience, courage, and compassion. As well as advance democracy by cultivating mutual respect, moral reflection, and honest conversation. Bridging divides and fostering reconciliation is a theme that strikes a chord, certainly with the Japanese American community, hopefully with almost all communities these days, and bridging the divide between Japanese Americans and the broader American community. We also want to encourage the internal healing of the community divisions and personal and family injuries that came from the internment camp experience. Uh, some measure of political reconciliation occurred when the President of the United States and Congress apologized to those affected by the internment order on behalf of the people of the U.S. Uh, and paid $20,000 to each surviving eligible person. Though I remember doing the story for the McNeil Laird News Report when I was working for PBS, and uh, I did a segment on how many people who qualified for that um, were dying off every month because they were stalling the process out so much. And every month it seemed like we were losing so many people that missed out on that part of the justice that they kind of deserved. So in many ways this is not a complete reconciliation, uh, and also because of the political, emotional, and psychological recovery from the camps that people continue to struggle with through this day, and partly because we fear that the broader U.S. public and politicians have still not fully learned of the lessons of the World War II internment experience. Uh, I'm going to join the panel here. I want to thank them all for being here. Uh, first of all, I'd like to go ahead and just have each panelist introduce themselves and give a brief biography to everybody here. A lot of people already know you, but uh, just give a brief biography here, especially with the perspective of what you'd like to talk about today. Go ahead. Well, first I want to say welcome. It's wonderful to have this opportunity to share our stories. My name is Alice Hikido. Um, I, um, my story is a little bit different because uh, when I was a child at nine when the war broke out, and uh, I did not live in California or Washington or Oregon, I lived in Alaska. And uh, not everyone knew that there were Japanese up in Alaska. And so um, the small community of Japanese and Japanese Americans um, <coughs> Where it was a different kind of experience because the day after Pearl Harbor, all the immigrant Japanese men in Alaska, wherever they were located, were immediately arrested by the FBI. And um, my father was one of those, so he was separating us from us very early. So I'm going to be speaking a little bit from that perspective, my story from that perspective. Thank you very much. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my name is Pat Sakito, and uh, I'm a Fort Worth veteran. Uh, I'm an engineer by profession, and uh, I, oh, my family and I were interned at the uh, Gila River uh, Relocation Center in Arizona, and uh, then I went out and went to school and uh, got drafted into the Army, and got wounded and came back. So. 
I'll share some of my experiences. Good morning. My name is Grace Kabode Barra. I was a year and a half old when uh, we were uh, shipped to Hard Rock, Wyoming. And uh, I spent my early years in the camp behind barbed wire. Um, <clears throat> my perspective is that my father was the only enemy alien who was part of the Fair Play Committee that um, supported the resistors, uh, the, the 63 men, young men, who uh, resisted the draft when they were called to serve while they were behind barbed wire. My experience has been different because my father was uh, in prison and my early growing up days was the discussion of his uh, prison experience at uh, the Leavenworth Penitentiary. I, have, uh, I am a practicing attorney. I should probably retire. I will be practicing 50 years next year. But my life's experience has been because my, of my father's experience. My father was uh, trained as a lawyer in Japan before he came to this country. And uh, my perspective of all that has happened to Japanese Americans and all that is happening now to all people of color is something that has um, motivated and directed my life and my life's experience. Um, my name is Susan Hayase. Um, I'm a third generation Japanese American. Uh, both my parents uh, were put in camp when they were in high school. Um, I was born in Washington, D.C. because uh, my parents were both in the East Coast after having left camp. Um, I grew up in Southern California in Orange County, uh, very conservative, uh, pretty racist uh, area. And growing up, I was uh, became very interested in why people are so racist, and I uh, that was a very formative uh, thing for me. And um, as a young adult, I spent uh, 15 years working on the redress campaign uh, for Japanese Americans. So I hope to talk to you about that. Very good. All right. And just a brief background for myself. I talked about journalistically. I've covered this issue for many years uh, through uh, PBS as well as uh, commercial TV stations. And also my uh, father, my grandparents, his parents, as well as my uncles were all at Heart Mountain. And my mother was born and raised in Japan, married my father later uh, during the Korean War and came here to the United States. And so uh, I have that perspective in terms of like the direct family involvement, as well as what my mother experienced coming here into an area where she was from in Japan, not facing any kind of racism, and then finally, and coming into a community, uh, the Bay Area, even at that time, where there was a lot of racism. So anyway, that's my perspective. Um, we also want to just point out that, you know, there are a lot of common experiences, a lot of common feelings that we all have about the experience uh, going through. We want to make sure that everyone here talks very personally about their experience because we really want to hear the differences of the experiences that kind of give us that broader understanding of what happened. We'll start with Alice. Uh, give me an idea, first of all, uh, your experience uh, with your family and the disruption went after Pearl Harbor, as well as what that experience was like, because again, you were sort of out of the area. I don't think that people really understand or had a feeling of like what it's like for people who are already isolated at the time that that happened. Well, I had already mentioned that my father was taken uh, right after Pearl Harbor. In fact, I mean, Pearl Harbor happened on a Sunday. Can I remember that? very clearly because the next day was Monday and I had to go to school and we were, I was one of two Japanese in our whole school. But uh, after coming home from that first day, um, it was another trauma because uh, I found the FBI at our, in our home searching our house looking for any kind of evidence that we might have been uh, conspiring with the, with the enemy, or so to speak. And at the end of the search, they, they took my father away. So as a family, we were tremendously bewildered. Um, all of a sudden, in one day, everything in our lives just changed. and was turned upside down. Uh, my father had a business, so naturally we had to close the business. I had two older brothers in high school. 
And so it fell upon them to uh, do this. My mother, who relied, who didn't speak English that well, she, yeah, she was very, all of a sudden, felt very insecure. We didn't have a Japanese community to fall back on. So um, it was a real period of, uh, as a child, I mean, these memories are so embedded in my mind, I'll never forget that particular time. But as a family, we did have to, um, my brothers and my mother and my younger sister and I, we all had to uh, uh, just plan what was going to happen to us. Because we didn't know with my father gone, we didn't know what was going to happen to us. The executive order hadn't come out yet, but in, uh, in April, which was a few months after that, we were um, instructed to be ready to be picked up by a transport ship that would take us away from our town. So that was the kind of the, the setting of um, the beginning of the war experience for us. Um, <coughs> go on to what well, what was the impact on your father? How did it change him, and how did it impact all of you? Because it's a multi generational impact. Right, okay. We did not hear from our father. We didn't know what happened to our father. <coughs> we, we, they arrested him and taken him to the jail, and then we were able to visit him a couple times, and then he was gone, and so he was really out of our lives. So we worried about him also. We didn't know what happened to him. So that that anxiety was always over us. Yeah. And um, uh, what was your question again? Well, basically how he changed, how it impacted you as a family when he did return. Well, he didn't return to us until 1944. We were sent to Minidoka Camp in Idaho. And um, one of the memories I have of living, of our very experience, uh, my brother was 18 years old. We just, he was, to be, he was to be graduating that particular spring. And he wanted to volunteer so badly when, the, uh, when they were told that they were going to form the 447. But my mother was so uh, alarmed because my father was already separated from us. And she, uh, the whole idea that something would happen to my brother was more than she could uh, there, she was really, so I remember this back and forth argument in our barrack room. My mother pleading with my brother not to volunteer, and my brother really wanted to do that. But finally she said, well, would you please delay this until my, until my father would be reunited with us. And so uh, he did consent to that. So my father came to us two years later from the Justice Department in In that period, we could have correspondence with him, but all his letters were highly censored. We really didn't know anything really very important that it him. So he came back to us. Uh, this is another memory in my mind of this, of this wanting to know what happened to him and having this really uh, back and forth conversation, all the questions. And we were really surprised when he told us about his interrogation when he was arrested, the fact that the FBI, evidently, they were surveilling a lot of these people in Alaska because they knew all the people that he had corresponded with. So anyway, he was telling us all that. And so when he came back to us, um, his authority naturally was he was the only figure in our family. He was a typical Japanese family. But then when he came back to us, and my mother said, I'm wanting to go and volunteer and join the army. Uh, we were surprised because my father, he, he consented. And he said that was fine. And so I think the authority of my father was a little bit in a different light at that point. I think one of the things that you mentioned, which will take us to Katz, I think, was why did your brother feel such a strong uh, obligation or commitment to joining the U.S. military, given the circumstances? Did he feel like he had to prove something? Very good question, because I think he really felt like he needed to prove that he was an American, that, that putting us all in camp 
was always there. I wanted, they were all 18, 19 years old, but they were very idealistic. They had uh, the government was wrong. Yeah. Cats, uh, you know, you have extensive military experience. You have a lot to talk about. But can we start talking about that first, which is you joining? Did you feel as though you and others had that kind of common denominator in terms of your attitude to prove that you're loyal Americans? Or what was the maybe the motivation that you saw in people kind of getting involved in the US military, given the internment camp experience? <coughs> Uh, you know, the uh, motivation is not so much to prove our loyalty, but, you know, as uh, Asian Americans, uh, before World War II, you know, we were subjected to a great deal of racial prejudice and discrimination. And, uh, you know, we were always second class, and uh, there were a lot of things we couldn't do. We couldn't buy houses in uh, bizarre areas. You know, we couldn't use public swimming pools. We couldn't join service clubs and things like that. And so, uh, you know, I think most of the Nisei uh, thought that serving in combat you know, would be a way to improve our situation in America after the war. And so I think that was a primary motivation that caused most of us to join the military. So, uh, so many people focus on the kind of legend and the history of the 442nd and things like that, but what was it like inside there? What was the attitude by the soldiers inside the 442nd? What was the attitude in terms of being in the US military knowing that Japanese Americans had been interned? Uh, how did you kind of deal with that kind of almost conflict? Uh, well, you know, I think it's a matter of pride for us. Uh, because like I said, you know, we're always treated like second class citizens and, uh, you know, and we always thought that serving in combat was a way to show Americans, you know, that we're as good as they are, so. Did it turn out to be that way then? Did the military turn out to be an improvement? Did the military turn out to be that sort of equal situation that you guys were seeking? Well, you know, for myself, I speak for myself, you know, uh, before the war, you know, Nisei could get uh, degrees in uh, engineering or the technical fields, and when they graduated, nobody would hire them. You know, they couldn't get jobs. But, you know, but when I came back from uh, the war and got my degree at Stanford, you know, I found out that uh, I could, after I graduated, I could get any job for which I was qualified. I mean, there was no question of my race or anything. And so, uh, you know, like I say, it was a huge difference between pre-war and post-war. Okay. That's interesting. What about the loyalty questionnaire? Uh, was that an issue for you, or what was that? <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Well, it was for a lot of people, too. Uh, the loyalty question that he's talking about was that, you know, in the uh, spring of 1943, the WRA, War Relocation Authority, which was responsible for running the camps, decided to start a relocation program in which, uh, you know, like students like myself who had uh, our college education interrupted, you know, could apply for admission to schools which are not on the West Coast, you know, in the exclusion area. And uh, also people who uh, wanted to leave and get jobs, you know, in areas which are not on the West Coast, if they found a job and a place to live, they would be allowed to go. But before the WRA could release us, they had a problem because they had put us in camp solely on the basis of our race and ancestry, you know, which said made us suspect. Thing. So then how could they turn around and let us go? Well, uh, they solved that dilemma by saying, well, we'll use this questionnaire. We'll let them declare their loyalty. And so they latched onto this questionnaire, which actually had been developed by the military to screen applicants for the 442nd uh, So they came up with the question, and the, uh, you know, there, there are 28 questions in this questionnaire. The first 26 were non-controversial. They were factual information, name, address, occupation, and that kind of thing. But it was the last two questions, 27 and 28, that were problematical. 
And, uh, I, you know, I could, I could, I could sort of paraphrase the uh, thing, but, you know, question 27 asks, are you willing to serve in the military service, including combat, and so ordered? Okay. And question 28 asks, uh, basically, uh, will you swear, will you uh, for, for, forbear any allegiance to the Emperor of Japan and declare your allegiance to the United States of America? Well, you know, to most people, those are simple questions, you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, the internees have been in camp for about nine months about that time, and got sort of paranoid. And so the first reaction was, why are you asking these questions now? Why didn't you ask this before you put us in camp? That was my question. And then the other, you know, they thought that these two questions were trick questions. Like 27, you know, I want to serve in the military service, including combat. He said, my gosh, if I say yes, am I volunteering for combat duty? So there was that confusion. Now question 28 said, will you forbear any, any allegiance to Emperor Japan? Now if I say yes, was it, am I admitting and I have a yes to Emperor Japan? And they thought they were trying to trap me into saying that. And so there was a lot of confusion and, uh, you know, uh, uh, a lot of rebellion at trying to answer that question. Now, initially, I answered question 27, no, that I was not, I didn't want to serve. But then, you know, the man who was administering this uh, questionnaire was a very decent guy, and he tried very hard to persuade me to change my mind. He explained to me the implication and so forth. But then at that time, I was adamant and said, no, I want to say no. So he said, okay, that's your life. But then I thought about it for about two or three days, and I thought, oh, he, I think he's right. You know, so I went back to him and said, can I change my answer? And fortunately for me, he let me change it. And boy, that was the single most important decision I ever made in my whole life. I would have to change my whole life, you know, because I wouldn't be sitting here today if I, you know, if had to change. But anyway, he let me change. I became a yes, yes, instead of a no, no. And uh, then I was drafted into the army, so. Wow, but it's still uh, the ultimate trick question kind of dilemma, huh? Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, um, just real quickly, did the people who answered no, what happened, what happened to them? Uh, well, you know, maybe Jimmy could say that. Uh, well, I, they, they were uh, separated from their families and sent to the segregation right. camp in Tuli Lane, yeah. you know, which was designated as segregation for people who were, uh, uh, quote, disloyal, you know, so yeah. based upon that. So. Grace, I think you can understand the dilemma there in terms of uh, the kind of situation that they were kind of put in. And also as a young person, you probably uh, kind of gauge a lot of the impact on you through the impact on your family, right? That's correct. <clears throat> the, the question 27 and 28, the, the men who answered no, no, became known as the no, no boys. And, um, and in, at Hawk Mountain, there were 63 young men. They were basically high school graduates who were, um, in, in, the, in, the, in the amazement and the beauty of all of this, is these men who answered no, no, basically had high school civics, high school history, studied the Constitution, and really believed in all those words that, um, that thought that their civil rights had been violated. And so they were, they comprised the no-no boys. Separate from that, but a part of it was the Fair Play Committee. And they were seven men who were not subject to the draft. Um, they were older men, they were exempted because they were married or by age or whatever. And my dad was uh, not one of, the, uh, one of the six people that started the Fair Play Committee. Uh, but the Fair Play Committee asked him, my father was a Japanese national, he was an enemy alien by definition, and, but because um, 
He could hardly speak English, but I will tell you, he was a wonderful public speaker in the Japanese language. And so they asked him if he would help them to explain the, the Fair Play Committee's story to the Japanese Issei, the first generation parents of these young men who were um, being caught in this, this dilemma. And so my father went uh, to make the speaking engagements to basically raise money because they knew that they were going to eventually be arrested, that they would have to litigate this case. And, um, and I remember as a child, I would go with my dad on his back and go to the very speaking engagements. And Heart Mountain in the winter is really cold. And, and I, I have only fleeting memories, but one of the things that I do remember was walking home on my dad's shoulder and telling him, Papa, it's cold. And he said, no, 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 it's not cold. But it was like Heart Mountain in the winter is freezing cold. And but my dad was part of that group. And as a result of that, he uh, eventually is arrested. He is tried in, um, in, in the courts. And he is sentenced to go to prison for two years. He had a shorter prison term than the other men. The other people, most of them, had, I think, got a four-year sentence. And so my dad goes to um, uh, Leavenworth Penitentiary. And my childhood is smattered with all stories of prison life. He was uh, a cellmate of Frank Emmy, who was the leader of this group. And, uh, and he and Frank Emmy spent <coughs> hours together, of course, because there wasn't much to do there. And from prison, my dad would send us letters. And uh, my dad's English was terrible, but Frank Emmy tried to help him write the letters, and he would write letters, and then he would draw pictures, cartoon pictures for me, in color. And uh, he could have maybe made it as a Disney cartoonist, because they were wonderful pictures. And that's what I would look forward to when we would get the letters from, from him. Uh, there was one picture that Frank Emmy drew of him uh, that was his, what he, a facial picture of my dad. So those were the memories that I had of, of his prison life. And afterwards, when he came back, in my family, it was always a real source of pride of what he had done. Uh, the case goes up to the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals. It's reversed. He is released after something like 13 months instead of his two-year sentence. And one of the things I remember of, of his prison life was really several things, but one of the things they had a judo demonstration, and my dad was a black belt. He was uh, trained in Japan by the man who invented judo from Jiu-Jitsu. And so he and Frank Emmy and a number of the men who had judo as their sport gave the demonstration. And, he, and they always believed that after that, all the other prisoners left them alone because they were small men, but they, were, they knew what they were doing. And so, but the other thing that was, to me, really compelling was my dad said, you know, he said, we were segregated. There was a white unit and an African-American black unit. And he said one of the things was that there was a man in the black unit who was a redhead and as white as a white man, but he was characterized and he was, he, he was considered black, so he was in the black unit. And my, I remember my dad saying, you know, even in prison, we're all prisoners. We have all broken the law in some form. But even in prison, there was discrimination where African Americans were segregated from the regular population. And that stayed with me for all of my life because just racial profile, discrimination of any kind is discrimination, is discrimination. The other thing I remember my dad was, Every winter, my mother would serve oatmeal in the winter for breakfast. And he would say, you know, this is the food that they gave us in prison. And then he would rattle off his prison number. And, and so it was 64 something. But those were the things that I remember about his prison life. The other thing I want to tell you is that my dad was a very, very serious diabetic. So a good part of the time, he was in the prison hospital. And it was there that he met Mr. Pendergast the Kansas City boss, and they were, they were in, hospital, in the hospital together. And, and 
The other story that my dad told us was that when FDR died, Mr. Pendergast said to him, Kubota, I'll be leaving here in a few days. And my dad said, I remember that one, it must have been a cold morning, a black limousine Cadillac driver was drove up to the prison yard, and there were two women he saw. One was younger, one was older in fur coats. And Mr. Pendergast left. And he had said, he invited my dad, he said, you know what, I'm going to get out of here. Come, I'll, I'll, you can have a job as a bodyguard. And Mr. Pendergast never made it. My dad, you know, we came, we came, he came back. But um, that was another poignant story because for as great as the Constitution is, and I believe that the Constitution is a great instrument, that politics still played because Harry Truman released the Kansas City boss at that time. One of the, and I think historically, it was one of the first things that Harry Truman did in his political life. But my, my perspective of all of this is, um, I've always been very proud of what my father did, my mother's involvement with my dad. Um, it took 75 years for the story of the no-no boys and the Fair Play Committee, the story to be told, because there was definitely a conflict in the Japanese community between the, uh, <clears throat> between the people who served their country, and they served it well and loyally, and my uncle was part of the 42nd, and the people who uh, protested. And they were both, both segments of the community were, were Americans. The JACL, who, uh, who really, supported the aspect of, of making sure that we, the, the Japanese American men served their country was that there, and there was this all camp policy in 1942 where they thought they had to earn their civil rights. But the no-no boys and the Fair Play Committee, their position was they, their civil rights were part of what they had because they, they were American citizens. And it's a different perspective. Um, and of course, I take the position you don't have to earn your civil rights. We are Americans. And that was probably the conflict in the community, in the Japanese community, that you know has not completely been resolved, but has there's been <coughs> some detente, I guess. Well, that's right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's almost part of the JACL story. Yes. Is the idea that. Um, a lot of people criticized them for not taking more of a rebellious stand, and nothing would have been accomplished without the rebelliousness of some of the people that got involved, including your father. However, the JCL was also trying to deal with the reality of internment and the idea that they were in a situation where they could not control everything they wanted to just from will or from principle. And so it was a very well, and, and, and you know, in 1967, when I had just become a lawyer, I, I, had, uh, I got a job with the Office of the Chief Counsel in, in Washington, D.C., so I trekked off to Washington and, and didn't like it. I couldn't handle the weather. But, uh, <laughs> but one of the things that happened was Norman Nettles was, uh, was a classmate of mine uh, in law school very briefly before he went off to politics. And we became friends. And he introduced me. His sister was married to Mike Masaoka. And his, uh, so he gave me the address. He said, you, you have to contact my sister and Mike when you get to Washington. So I did. And they graciously invited me for dinner. And it was, it was a lovely time until Mike Masaoka said to me, Kubota, Kubota, I know that name. And I said, yes, my dad was part of the Fair Play Committee. And he said, oh, I remember them. I told them they couldn't win. And, if, and, and my perspective was, it's not that you can win or lose in a court of law. It's that as Americans, we have the right to question. We have the right to question. And the minute we forget that, we have lost every single part of what makes us American, because we are a country that should be ruled by law, not by anybody's whim. Mm -hmm. And I think that what's happening now in our country is that we are being tested again for that very principle, that we are a country ruled by law. One of the uh, progressions in terms of the different conflicts within the community and how to deal with it was also the idea of uh, whether to put the experience behind us 
like a lot of my uncles thought, which was and reparations, you know, apology, the apology especially, but also some sort of slam dunk. You know what I mean? They should want this. And yet it wasn't as easy of an issue. It kind of evolved slowly. So, um, yeah, redress um, was a, a really interesting thing. So from the time of the, the camp's closure, uh, up until the time that Japanese Americans decided to go for redress, there were a lot of stories being told about Japanese Americans, and Japanese Americans were being used by different political forces. Um, and one of the stories that was told was that Japanese Americans went quietly to concentration camps, and that nobody ever protested, and wasn't that just wonderful? And um, I think it's really important for, for people to, to know this, and it came out during the course of the redress movement was that there were many people that protested the laws leading up to the camps, and there were four Supreme Court cases that came out of these protests. There were hunger strikes and work stoppages and uh, demonstrations within the camps, and the questionnaire that Katz was talking about, the loyalty oath, a lot of the people who answered no, yes, and yes, no, or with qualifications, that was a, a form of protest. Um, so the redress movement also, if you think about it, is a, is a, a real uh, protest because it says that, you know, Japanese Americans never got their day in court. Um, and, the, and it wasn't a slam dunk because, uh, I don't know if you, remember what was happening at that time, but people were promoting the model minority like crazy. And uh, people said, how dare you ask for equal treatment? I mean, they didn't say it like that, right? But um, how dare you, you know, that, you know, we thought you were honorable. You know, we thought you were quiet and not like those other people. And you know, who they're always trying to uh, use Japanese Americans against African Americans. So, um, so the whole redress movement was a shock to a lot of people. Um, it also was a tremendous uh, endeavor for the Japanese American community. As you can imagine, um, a lot of people had suffered a lot and had uh, exited the camps financially ruined. There were people who were trying to start over in their mid-60s um, who had children. And it was pretty tough. And, um, when I was 23 years old. Uh, I uh, the first time I heard about the redress movement was just an astounding thing to me because, uh, as I mentioned, I had spent my childhood trying to figure out why people were so racist and trying to figure out what the camps meant. I remember in third grade I asked a teacher. I told the teacher that my parents were in camp, and she told me, and this is what in California she told me that didn't happen. And um, that's some gaslighting to an eight-year-old, right? And um, so I was 23. I came to, uh, I was in San Jose, and I joined some people in Japantown. And uh, we realized that the first thing was that we had to get former attorneys to talk about their experience. And we met some people, and we ordered some house meetings. We said, can you bring your uh, family members to this house meeting and talk about camp and nobody talked about camp and so we had this house meeting and I remember uh, we did a little slideshow talking about the National Coalition for Redress Reparations and then we turned to people and we said what happened to you and um, people just cried like people hadn't spoken about it for like 35 years, some people had never told their kids what had happened to them. And it was an incredible uh, uh, moment for the former internees, but also for the Sansei, who were the children of former internees. And uh, we asked people to testify in front of the government uh, and a lot of people, you know, they're not public speakers. And you can imagine that facing the government could be a very daunting experience. 
and people didn't want to do it, but um, we told them, you know, it's not for yourself, you know, it's for other people. And a lot of people stepped forward and they said, you know, I know it's not for myself, I just don't want it to happen to anybody else. And, and that was, that was like a real <coughs> moral force that started to mobilize people in our community. Um, there were people from all walks of life. In, in our organization, there were a lot of Sansei, third generation, but there were also a lot of working class Nisei who uh, maybe didn't fit into some of the Japanese American professional organizations. We had farmers <coughs> and we had a janitor and a nurse and a butcher. And um, uh, these people who had never gone to college, uh, they stepped forward and they blossomed under the chance to uh, make, a, make a stand for equal treatment and justice. And um, so after uh, many years of ups and downs uh, in Congress, uh, we finally were able to change, you know, there was an election and the Democrats took control of Congress and we were finally able to get our redress bill out of committee. And um, in 1988, uh, the law was passed, and um, nobody knows why Reagan signed the bill. He actually had uh, vocally opposed it, but, um, and there's whole documentaries about, <laughs> about this issue, it's kind of interesting, but uh, he signed the bill, and it took another uh, three years for the government to allocate payments. That was something to learn about the government, that they could pass a bill and not allocate any money to pay for it. Uh, and uh, so uh, that was a whole interesting experience. Um, I think uh, some of the lessons that uh, we learned from this experience, one was uh, that we learned from all different sectors of Japanese Americans who both volunteered or were drafted or who resisted um, was that you really you have to do the right thing. You have to do the, the you know from the bottom of your heart. You have to try to do the right thing for yourself and for others. And um, that was really important because there were there were people who thought that we couldn't win, and they were mostly focused on that, but we felt that it was so important to push this, to make sure that it could, couldn't happen to other people. That was the thing. Right, and we bring it to the modern day as well. One of the things I wanted to mention too, though, because I was covering that story and the evolution of it, and the idea of the first battle being getting it passed, the second one getting the money for it. And that was like one of the, the, one of the ones I did for McNeil there was, where's the money? Every month, I mean, it was almost like eight to ten people were dying every month. We're supposed to get something. Also, too, the original proposal was fifty thousand dollars, not twenty thousand dollars, and that was one of the things that had to change before Reagan would consider signing. And uh, also, I remember that in a way, what was interesting was that uh, there was a real emphasis on everyone in ecology, and the ecology was in principle almost as important, if not more important than the money, yet, as you were saying, they were trying to kind of turn that around and saying, we thought you were honorable people and you want this, we'll give you the apology, but you know, why do you want money? And I, I know a lot of Japanese Americans then kind of turned around and realized that, you know, <laughs> someone's trying to pull a fast one, and they're saying, well, no, no, we want money too. And that's how they ended up being kind of a part and parcel thing. But I remember that being a big consideration. That delay was huge. And uh, I know what you mean. There was a movement, um, and maybe because it was a Democratic Congress, but there was a movement that shifted public opinion in favor of having done it. Um, but I was like you at the time, surprised that Reagan went ahead and did it. And I think that maybe it was just maybe the sign of the times that, that he recognized that he needed to. I also want to mention, partly because of the mission of the Faith and Politics Institute in uh, reaching out to Congress and trying to bridge gaps, uh, uh, diverse representation in Congress is so important. 
um, are the uh, earliest and most staunch supporters of redress was the Congressional Black Caucus. And um, one of the first redress bills was introduced by Mervyn Donnelly of Los Angeles. And um, that's just huge. And so I think that uh, for people of color who strive to get into Congress in positions of leadership, it's really important to uh, recognize that, you know, uh, we should support them and they have a role to play, you know, in bringing justice and equality to this country. So, that's fine. Well, we talk about lessons learned. Let me just start with, and go this way again, which is, do you feel the lessons learned were permanent? Well, what are your thoughts as you see the world right now and how uh, those lessons apply or don't apply to the way people view things now? Well, I don't think lessons are necessarily permanent because we can look at today's uh, um, the scenario around us today politically. But it, it's always, I think for us to tell our stories is very important because uh, it's a good reminder that we don't, we're not really good at learning our lessons. And so we need to be always told again and again. And um, not to be discouraged. Um, what's happening, we're all, many of us are very discouraged right now, um, our political scene. But I think it's so important to not just tell our stories to political people, but also to um, neighbors, and friends and such. You know, I'm back in my hometown, a little home, little town, 20,000 in Alaska, we just recently, this was started by the community people, not by any Japanese um, folks, but they were aware of what had happened to us 70 some years ago. And they felt that the story was very important to preserve, so they made a memorial and it was originally maybe just a memorial for the townsfolk to, to uh, uh, keep the story of what happened to us you know, in this community. But the beauty of this memorial is that 300,000 tourists come through our town every year. Many of you have probably have taken a cruise yourself to Alaska, but and everybody doesn't get off the cruise ship and go on a walking tour and see our memorial. But I have been told that so many people have seen that memorial that knew nothing about the internment. They came from the Middle West, back east. They were unaware, and they were maybe a generation that were unaware of this um, piece of American history. And so our town is so proud that we can share the story. We have a force in educating um, folks in the country. And so that's our challenge. And so that I feel good about that. And I feel very good that these were our friends and neighbors. They were not Japanese, but they considered us as their friends and neighbors. And they recognized that this is a story that needs to be told so that the character of our country can remain you know, a country of liberty, equal rights for everyone. Yeah, and that's something that I'd like to also address a little later too, which is the idea that, you know, because it's hard sometimes not to talk in broad strokes, but there were people outside the Japanese American community that helped the Japanese American community. And in fact, a lot of people, uh, their livelihoods and their futures were uh, guaranteed or saved or rescued by people like that. But Cass, can you get an idea here in terms of what your thoughts are in terms of the way you see the world right now? Especially, you know, at that time, uh, the military was sort of a way for at least people to, you know, rightly or wrongly demonstrate loyalty or things like that. The military is kind of a different kind of scene altogether nowadays. What are your thoughts in terms of the world of today as you see it and whether the past lessons have made the impact that you'd like it to? Okay. Um... Uh, first, you know, I want to say uh, about the Bill of Rights, you know, why did they protect their rights, you know. Uh, you know, in 1788, when uh, the Bill of Rights was being ratified to become the first ten amendments to the Constitution, you know, James Madison wrote to Thomas Jefferson, 
pointing out how ineffectively Bill of Rights is in protecting the rights of minorities at the time when they need that protection the most. And that's when it's the majority wants to trample on the rights of the minority. And our American history shows how true that is because in the 1800s, you know, what we did to the American Indians is shameful. Same, similarly, what happened to the black men in the 20s and 30s uh, is nothing to be proud about. And whatever the Constitution says about rights did nothing to prevent us from being hustled off in the Constitution camps. And so, you know, it, it takes a lot of diligence on the part of the American citizens, citizenry, to be aware of these things because, you know, the words that a piece of paper is not going to protect you. You know, it, it, it takes a lot more than that. It takes public opinion. It takes public, uh, you know, support. And so meetings like this, which is uh, hopefully will inform the public of the wrongs, you know, will be helpful. So. As long as people keep on speaking up, huh? As long as people keep speaking up huh? about it. It's progress. As long as people keep speaking up. Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Grace, what about you? What are your thoughts? Uh, optimistic, <laughs> pessimistic about what you're seeing now and whether the past <laughs> lessons have been learned enough to make things permanent or? I think that we have to ever be vigilant. That is what I, I'm taking away from it because our country right now, it's, it's it may not be Japanese Americans, but it's still the African Americans, the American Indians, the transgender gay community. I think we are, and the Muslim community. I think there is, there are threats that are being made always. And, and my great hope is, of course, and it's my perspective, you know, we refer to camp euphemistically, like it was summer camp or something. No, it was. They, 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 this was the concentration camp. But throughout the time that we grew up, people would say, well, when we were in camp or after camp or before camp or whatever. But camp was, for us, the 10 internment camps that were established by the, by the government during the war. But <clears throat> what, what happened right after that, and I remember that, is that um, my parents, we, we concentrated on educating ourselves. You know, we probably, the, the Nisei Sansei, that crossover group, are probably some of the most educated people of any minority group. And that has also been used against us in a way, uh, in, in kind of a racist way. You know, well, if you're, if you're a Japanese American, of course, you're that quiet group of people. You're the ones that just did everything. You're the ones that are educated. You're the ones that made it, so why can't everybody else make it? And, 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 and that's, that's a reverse type of discrimination that, um, that we have to be ever, ever aware of. But what I want to say was the, the group afterwards, the Sansei, the third generation Japanese Americans, um, the people who really uh, fought for redress, it wasn't the money. It was that part of that governmental grant was it was about a half a million, five hundred thousand dollars. About five million. Five million that was given for education, and that has done a lot because there is a lot of literature, videotapes, uh, you know, stories that have been told. Because every you know, well, it, there might have been one hundred twenty of us that went in. Each of us had a different story, and when you hear those stories, each story, you know, is a poignant story. That the children of the orphans of Manzanar. That was a, that's another subtext of all of this that has happened, and um, the education I think is so critically important yeah. that the story be told. And and we're losing. I mean, I I was just a year and a half old. And my idea of camp was you know they gave us snacks, oyatsu, which was just wonderful. We looked forward to it. I was always playing with my cousins. We all had slanted eyes. We all looked the same. And the shock was when we came out that there was another world outside and that people called us Jap. 
and that, you know, you, you know, some people say it means Jewish American princess, but for us, <laughs> for us, it means another thing, and it is, it will always live with me, and it's always part of my history and my, my perspective. That's right. We do have to maybe come up with another word besides camp, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I always point out to people that somebody mentioned to me was, well, just think of it, it's not a camp if everything's geared to keep people in instead of keep things out. And so that's uh, an important distinction. Uh, what about you? Well, you touched on that earlier, but your thoughts in terms of just the way things are now and whether the past has made enough of an impact on the present and hopefully the future. Um, one of the things that, one of the projects that um, my husband Tom and I are working on with other people is uh, to try to uh, do public education. So Japanese Americans have been doing public education about the camps for decades because the idea is that if you educate people about what happened that they won't do it again. So it turns out that it looks like that's not a guarantee. <laughs> so um, we're also trying to draw people's uh, attention to the parallels between what happened to Japanese Americans and what happened, has happened to many other groups. Like for instance, uh, the Chinese exclusion and the, all the different uh, attempts to deport Mexican Americans and the current efforts to uh, uh, ban and uh, register uh, Muslims. I think, uh, and it's it's interesting now that there are people, there's kind of a, a resurgence of people who are espousing what's called white nationalism. And that is the idea that Americans have to be white. That if you're not white, you're not a real American. And so I think that if you look back at these, the Chinese exclusion, the deportations of, Jap of uh, Mexican Americans, those were the forces that were active then. And so I think that what we're trying to do is make people understand that this is really serious. And uh, so much damage can happen, so much harm can happen to individuals and communities and that we have to all, all join together and all stand up. You know, people talk about, oh, you gotta stand up for yourself. Well, yes, everybody's gotta stand up for themselves. But we have to make sure that we stand up for each other because the, as everybody has eloquently said in different ways, the Bill of Rights is not self-enforcing. We have to do it, we have to do it, all of us. Yeah, when you hear the people make the call for, you know, you have to stand up for yourselves or the model minority or anything like that, ultimately you find out that basically it's kind of being used in a divisive way. You know, it's to pit one group against another or groups against each other. Uh, and generally speaking, I found that to be the case. So it really is a trap that you can fall into because ultimately it really isn't being used by a lot of people to unite. It really is a way of keeping people. Thing. I remember when I was growing up, um, I remember uh, minorities kind of just viewed themselves as minorities. And blacks, Latinos, Asians, uh, they all kind of related to each other as minorities. Uh, then as each group became kind of more distinct, and more maybe united within that group, it also then kind of made it a little more splintered and, and I think it enabled some of the things that are happening now uh, to happen, which is, you know, you have a lot of small groups instead of one united group. Uh, I should also point out that when I was in high school, uh, we had, I went to Sunnyvale High School, which was before Silicon Valley, and so uh, we had almost majority minorities, if you want to put all the minorities together. But nobody viewed the whites as white people, like as enemy, because they were not privileged white people. You know, they were just white people, and so everybody kind of related to them the same as uh, they did to each other. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's kind of a socio-economic kind of situation. And uh, you know, and I felt that much more when I was watching last night's uh, GOP budget thing process going on, and the way they were dividing. The groups was really seventy-five thousand dollars a year and under, and one hundred thousand and up, and then one million and up, and it was really it doesn't really matter. It's all about economics, but it's also very divisive. So to kind of balance that out, does uh, anybody have stories they want to tell about people who are outside the community 
that helped your community, you know, people who stepped in to help and make sure that people understand that it wasn't, you know, that, you know, everybody was against the Japanese Americans. Well, I think mean, that's a very important part of my story because, um, well, for one thing, during the war, when my father was separated from us, and we were, he was in the Justice Department camp, and we were in the, what we would call the uh, um, relocation camps, there were people in our home, in my hometown, that wrote affidavits to the government, um, telling, saying that my father was a boy from Britain. So there were individuals during that time that that wanted to help. They couldn't. Maybe they couldn't get us out of the camps, but they wanted to at least unify us as a family because that was very important to us. But when we came out after the war, my father was now 64. And so, he, and he had lost his business and his savings. He still had a relatively young family to raise. So he came out, and he was able to easily get a loan without any collateral. He started his cafe before the war. He started his cafe again, and the suppliers said to him that he didn't have his friends. They were we were we were a small town, and they said to my father that he didn't have to pay his bills until he had a cash flow that would allow that to happen. And then my father wasn't sure if his old customers would come back. He opened up his cafe and his customers came back and welcomed us all back into the community. They were,
was the attorney who helped the Fair Play Committee, and he, and of course he didn't, I don't think he ever got paid anything very much, but he was the attorney of record for the Fair Play Committee on their, uh, on their defense. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's an important element. And culturally speaking, too, because again, as I've said before, the arts are a way to reach people that might not necessarily be swayed by political uh, or other kinds of uh, arguments. Um, but um, George Takei had a play on Broadway that he was bringing to Los Angeles and eventually hopes to bring it to the Bay Area. And we did a segment with him just recently, as well as uh, Luis Valdez. I went to go see a play of his in downtown San Jose, uh, Valley of the Hearts of Light. And that was about an internment uh, family that went off to camp and a Latino family uh, held their farm for them until they got back. So uh, there's a lot of different you know, ways that people are kind of trying to portray that. And I think it's important to always look at the broad picture uh, in that way. Uh, we have just enough time to open it up for some questions from the audience. If anybody would like to ask any of the panelists any of these questions, uh, otherwise we will be wrapping it up after that. Any questions for the panelists? Anybody remember Phil Donahue's show? Hi. Um, uh, you, you, you just provided a bunch of very interesting anecdotes about, uh, about assistance that, that attorneys had from, from uh, non japanese American families. Could you speak to the other side of that? Because I certainly have the impression, as perhaps most of us do, that a great deal of property is not recovered that there was a fair bit of fraud, uh, in a sense, of confiscating, taking away, misusing, never returning a Japanese American property after the war. Could you put that in perspective? There were um, there were a lot of people who lost property, and, and the mechanism is pretty simple. Like if you, what happened is people lost their jobs and their ability to have an income. The federal government froze their funds. Right, so they could, if they had a loan to buy some, you know, to buy a car or to buy a house or whatever, they they couldn't pay it, so they just lost it. So that's a big uh, source of a lot of people's loss. Uh, also, there were people who were kind of the opposite of some of the nice people that that were mentioned, who uh, said that they would take care of people's property and they didn't. So there were there were people who sold Japanese American uh, people's property and took the profit. And I think one reason why we wanted to address the people helping is because that is sort of a minority, you know, for the most part. Uh, it wasn't so much that poverty got seized, uh, as you were talking about, the mechanism was important, which is if you don't pay for the property, you lose the property, and somebody will eventually own it. My grandparents had an interesting situation, and they were helped uh, in order to get property to start a new farm, and we were, they were just fortunate because they were farmers, and at that time, it wasn't like now, where property is extremely difficult to get. Uh, there was a lot of parcels where people maybe didn't consider them a great farmland, and the Japanese American farmers kind of proved them wrong and turned them into profitable uh, farms. But yeah, the majority of the uh, uh, situation, I think, were mostly negative. But we just don't want to lose sight of the fact that they were assisted by people uh, that did get help from the outside. Any more? Oh, here we go. Hi, I'm Sumi Tanabe, and I'm a child of the internment camps. He, uh, Jerome Martin saw they closed down that camp, and it wasn't until many, many years later that it was because the German POWs were coming in. And so we were moved, and the war was still going on, so we had to go to uh, Hilla, Arizona. So from the swamplands of Arkansas to the desert of Arizona. But to ask and add on to your question, when the FBI came to our house in Long Beach, my father asked that because he was a Nissan, the number one son, he was responsible for his family. And so he asked that could he go to Fresno where the rest of his family were and his parents. And uh, the FBI agent said, well, we're at Walmart now. You're going to have to plant your vegetables. He was a vegetable farmer. And my father said, well, I can't do that. I have no money. Because the federal government, according to my parents, already took the money that he had in the Yokohama Species Bank in Los Angeles. So I don't know if this is a story that's been repeated with other families, 
But it took my father, he had to go around to his Japanese friends before we were taken to Fresno to borrow money, enough money so he could plant the crops before we left. And it took him 10 years to repay back all those Japanese farmers. So is that true? Were, was the US government, before we even went to camps, confiscated monies from the Japanese and Japanese Americans that were in Yokohama Species Bank? I can also speak to that because um, that was the experience of my, my parents' savings. They were in the Yokohama Species Bank. And because my father was sent to the Justice Department camp, his status was a little bit different than uh, the status of the rest of us Japanese Americans. And so my father never really got his money back. My mother had some money, but she was not in the bank, she actually got some of that money back after the war, but the devaluation of the yen and was quite great at that time. But I always remember that all the hard work of my father, because he was sent to the Justice Department camp, his status was different. We have time for one more question. Well, we might be able to squeeze it, too. Uh, since uh, right now we're in a Methodist church, and I know we're going to a Buddhist church shortly, um, I have a question as to whether or not you perceived that Japanese who were Christians might have been treated differently than non-Christian Japanese. Was there a, uh, that kind of distinction made uh, during those years? I'm afraid if you looked Japanese, it probably didn't help you too much. <laughs> I, I read um, a, a book about uh, how the government graded those um, loyalty questionnaires. And if, if you were Christian, you got more points. And if you, uh, you got demerits if you were not a Christian. And then also, I think if you did judo, that was a bad thing. If you were a boy scout, that was a good thing. You know what I mean? So they basically which was a Quaker-run school, and the Quakers paid my way, all my expenses and everything, so I owe the Quakers a great deal. And I think a lot of other Japanese students owe the Quakers a lot, too, so. <laughs> oh, thank you, then. <laughs> One of the things that I know that the Quakers did at Heart Mountain in any event is they would send um, the first layout of babies that were born in camp. And my brother, uh, my younger brother was born in camp. His name was Gordon, after Gordon Yorobayashi. Um, and my mother received a, a, a layout for him, and she never forgot that. And so as part of her estate, when she passed away in, 19, in 2012, the, the Quakers got a, a, a bequest from them because it was something she always talked about. She was always grateful because in camp, when you were in camp and you had to get the clothes, you had to uh, order it through the Montgomery Ward's catalog or whatever. And so when she got that first little set of clothing for my brother, it was something that she remembered for the rest of her life. And yes, so the Quakers were. And I know that Judge Ito's mother uh, was educated uh, by the, helped by the Quakers. Mm -hmm. And so she also. Uh, tells the story of how she went to school as a result of the Quakers. Okay, well, a discussion about Quakers in the Methodist Church as you get ready to go to the Buddhist Church is a good way to end the Faith and Politics Institute seminar. Thank you very much for attending. Let's hear from the uh, panelists here. Thank you all for being here. Please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.